Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success podcast with me, Christian Harris. And today I wanted to share a recent episode of the Safety Roundtable, which I run every Wednesday at nine o'clock. Uh, if you've not come along, then um, if you listen to this podcast, then I'm sure you'd be a fan of these sessions uh, because we do a deep dive on different safety related topics each week. You can find details for that at safetyroundtable.co.uk. It's an interactive uh, Zoom session, normally with sort of 20 to 40 people joining in and, and talking about different safety topics each week. Um, but this week on the Roundtable, I did a session on slipology. So thinking about what I do on a daily basis in terms of the uh, better understanding of and prevention of slip and fall accidents and talking really about how to move away from platitudes and to move away from a superficial approach and to move away from making assumptions about slips and falls, which I think is something that, you know, if we're honest, lots of us have been guilty of in the past and moving towards a scientific approach. So we talk here about chimes, the six reasons people slip. Uh, and we talk about three of the areas in particular and give you examples of how exactly you can scientifically measure what you need to do to achieve the right kinds of outcomes and then how those outcomes uh, are delivered and how you can quantify those. So how can you reduce the risk of a slip and fall by a factor of 50,000 X? Um, sounds interesting, maybe sounds implausible, but you can do that. Um, how can you reduce your number of accidents, injuries and claims by an average of 57% plus? Um, maybe that sounds implausible, but you can definitely do that. Um, lots of our clients uh, do that. That's In fact, that's the outcome that our clients achieve on average. Um, some of them do much, much better than that. So uh, I wanted to share this because I thought it was a really uh, good session. I had some great questions from uh, panel members at the end as well. And I think that you'll get some value from it. Uh, there's also a special offer if you wait until the end uh, for anybody that uh, happens to uh, watch or listen to uh, this podcast where we're offering 50% off of a pendulum slip test visit to start to introduce some science into your slip and fall uh, risk management strategy. So let's join the session then, um, Slipology on the Safety Roundtable. Uh, no guest this week, uh, you're stuck with me, uh, Christian Harris, uh, but I hope nonetheless you enjoy the session. Cheers. Welcome to the Safety and Risk Success Podcast with Christian Harris. We believe that proactive safety and risk management powers business performance. Each week we explore this theme, sharing guests, stories, insights, trends, hints and tips. You can find us on all the major podcasting platforms and video versions are available on YouTube. But for now, let's join the conversation with Christian. Let's make a start then. So thanks for joining today's Safety Roundtable, which is on the subject of slipology. So putting the science into slip and fall prevention. And really, this is all about how business can save money with this approach. Now, I'm going to start with a story. Uh, as to why we're here, I suppose, and give you a bit of context on this. So a good friend of mine, an industry friend who's also a client, uh, is um, head of QSHE for a large facilities management business. And a few years ago, he was at a meeting, a sort of annual um, summary meeting, running through P&Ls and achievements and all that good stuff. And one of his colleagues who was a regional director, stood up and started waxing lyrical about the achievements of his division throughout the year. Now, I don't know if this was a, a vertical division or an industry sector or, or a region, whatever it might be, but it was, you know, we won this contract, uh, we retained this contract, uh, we delivered this great standard, here's our um, customer satisfaction scores, which are all excellent, um, here's our top line growth, aren't we great? So on the face of it, everything looked rosy. My friend, however, had to stand up and interject, um, somewhat awkwardly, I guess, and say, that's all well and good, 
but we would have made more money this year had none of your staff turned up to work at all. Because all of that good work, all of that sales, all of those uh, sales, uh, all of the growth, all of the retention was obviously producing revenue. Um, that was producing a gross profit. Um, but all of the profitability of that division had been wiped out through accident and claim costs. And if you are in the facilities management business, <clears throat> then it's no surprise to hear, just as in many other sectors, uh, that the biggest cause of accident, injury and claim is slips and falls. So this whole thousands of people, uh, all of their good work had been wiped out uh, in large part, uh, the biggest reason by slip and fall costs. So that's an interesting story, just to illustrate the point here, which is that this is a very, very costly problem that we're looking at solving. And sadly, it's often overlooked. Um, but if you actually get, drill into the, da the data and get into the details, it is an expensive thing. I've got another uh, little story for you um, and a bit of a harsh truth. Um, are, we, are we as good as we think we are? I was at the Health and Safety Expo last week and I bumped into my friend um, James McPherson, who hosts the Rebranding Safety podcast. He's been on my podcast as well, and I've been on his. I was his first ever guest, actually. Um, and he was running a, uh, a live recording of his podcast, uh, asking a panel a few questions. And one of the questions was, is safety too full of platitudes? Uh, he actually asked me that question as well, because he was going around with a roving camera uh, and recording people answering different questions. And I attended a different talk at the event, the expo as well, which was about falls. And uh, a lady stood up and she said words to the effect of, I can't remember the exact expression, you know, you're all doing such a great job and such a huge amount of work at stopping slips, trips and falls in your business. Um, however, let's think about what we can do in the home. Now, I don't disagree with the sentiment that we should be looking at what we can do in the home as well as at work. Um, but actually, it struck me that, you know, you're all doing such a large amount in your jobs to reduce the risk of slips and falls, I thought was a bit of a platitude. Be interested to get your feedback, let me know in the comments what you think about that. Um, but my view on that is, is not trying to be too critical or too harsh, but it's driven by the data. So if you look at the last five years of um, the HSE vital statistics, which they publish annually, and you look at the causes of riddles as a percentage, um, slips, trips and falls as a category, um, 2017, 31%, 2018, 19, uh, 29%, 2019, 20, 29%, 2021, I think it was 30% or 29% again, uh, 21 slash 22, 33%. Now that is not improving. That's as flat as a pancake. Um, so, you know, perhaps we are doing a lot, but actually there's still a long way to go. You know, if we're seeing a third of all of our accidents, all of our riddles are slips, trips and falls. And when you break this down, interestingly, if you look at um, claims data, which is one of the most accurate ways of, of um, trying to split out slips, trips and falls as a category, uh, it's 80% slips, 20% trips. Um, AXA Insurance, for example, spends 80 million a year or they were spending before the pandemic 80 million a year of claims on slips and their next biggest cause of claim was manual handling which was 30 million so slips was more than twice as big as manual handling uh, and trips was on top of the 80 million of slips uh, but it was obviously much less than, um, than the 30 million so again if you look at the data um, you know are we doing all we can is it a platitude to say we're we're doing we're doing well um, now look I'm not I'm not saying we're doing badly because um, I think most companies that I uh, deal with and go in and try to help are doing a good job I would say um, but the question is can we go from good to great and it's this kind of safety plateau um, which I know people have talked about a lot and, and the slip trip fall category data kind of mirrors a lot of safety data we see so we've improved significantly over uh, 20 or 30 years, but in the last 
five or ten years we're starting to plateau so good has got us good in inverted commas uh, has got us kind of stuck on this plateau and it's certainly true in the world of slips um so uh, when we think about what we can do to go from good to great uh, in the field of slips that's where this kind of concept of slipology comes in so another way of looking at it is let's move away from being superficial so certainly in the field of slips and falls there's a lot of superficial stuff that goes on uh, you'll have seen if you are following me on linkedin some posts i did in the run-up to this round table about yellow signs and about entrance matting two great examples where uh, people take a very superficial approach uh, towards trying to stop slips and falls you know oh we'll stick a yellow sign out that'll be okay actually no that's not true at all uh, in fact in uh, probably the most serious slip and fall case that i've been involved in and, and the largest sorry the second largest now uh, slip and fall criminal fine uh, in history in the uk was a case where a man slipped and fell banged his head and sadly passed away in a co-op store in 2015 uh, there was at least one yellow sign out so the yellow sign it didn't stop him slipping it didn't stop him banging his head it didn't stop him dying uh, it didn't stop a criminal prosecution costing the co-op 400,000 pounds and it didn't stop a civil claim from his family either so yellow signs you know are definitely not the answer here. that's a superficial approach entrance matting another good example oh we've got entrance matting so we're fine um have you ever stood inside on a wet day and actually uh, assessed how effective your entrance matting really is i've got a great photograph from a busy train station for example where they've got i would say about three to four meters of matting so that's a lot more matting than most buildings i see um, would ever have uh, but yet the floor is absolutely sodden uh, past that matting so the matting isn't doing what you think it is it's not keeping the floor safe it's not because it's not keeping the floor dry so therefore that's quite a superficial uh, a way to, to look at this. Um, what we need to get to is a more scientific approach to safety, specifically thinking about slips and falls. And again, that's where this slipology idea comes in. So if you've um, heard me or, or seen me talk before about uh, slip safety, you've probably come across this acronym called CHIMES. And, and these are the six reasons why people might suffer from a slip and fall and therefore they're the six areas that you need to look at as a business uh, or an organization to try to minimize risk i'll quickly run you through what uh, chime stands for so c is for contamination and in very basic terms if a floor is perfectly clean we'll get onto that in a minute and perfectly dry then it's very very unlikely to be slippery but if you introduce any kind of contamination onto that floor uh, whether that be uh, you know a spillage um, uh, some um, something coming in off someone's foot uh, something dripping off of a uh, an umbrella any number of ways that contamination can get onto the floor uh, that will affect the likelihood of someone slipping h is for heel so this is all about footwear uh, again, we're going to talk a little bit more about this in a minute, as this is one of the areas that I'm going to draw out some science to help you. Um, footwear is a big control measure because obviously in order for somebody to slip, um, their foot has to touch the floor. Uh, and there are all sorts of differences between different types of footwear that can make slips more or less likely. Individual is all of the human factors. So this relates to um, demographics for example uh, if you are older then you're more likely to fall uh, than if you're younger because your ability to balance is um, is uh, is lessened as the as you get older you're also more likely to suffer a serious injury clearly because if you um, you know if you fall uh, and you're 85 versus if you're 25 you're more likely to break a bone and your recovery is going to take longer as well um, so there's that factor to consider who is actually walking on these floors uh, but there's also things that we can do uh, to try to mitigate risk uh, so thinking about signage um, 
signage is often inappropriately used, but it can be effective. It's thinking about can we manage uh, the way that people move around? So can we minimise the amount of pushing, pulling, twisting, turning, carrying that people are doing? Because all of those things increase the level of risk. Maintenance is another one we're going to do a deep dive on. Uh, and this is mostly about cleaning. Uh, so if we can keep floors properly clean, uh, then the level of safety will be uh, greater. Uh, but it also includes things like wear and tear. So surfaces will change over time and uh, change of use as well. E is for environment. So this is obviously things like the weather. So Manchester versus Mauritius in terms of uh, level and, and, uh, and frequency of rain, uh, for example. Uh, but it's also things like steps, stairs, slopes, lighting, noise, condensation, which is an issue that uh, the places often get. Um, so all of these environmental uh, controls, how can we take a scientific approach there? And then S is for surface, so the floor. Uh, we can all uh, accept, I think, or I hope, that some floors are less slippery than others. So what can we do to understand exactly how slippery our floor is and try to, uh, you know, if we're choosing a new floor, put in the, the appropriate level of slip resistance. Um, if we've got an existing floor, think about what we can do to increase the slip resistance of the existing floor. So all of these six areas are things that we need to manage. And all of them have some qualitative kinds of stuff in there, some softer things we can do, but they all have some lots and lots of quantifiable measurable scientific things that we can do so we're going to talk about slip testing we're going to we can talk about size of matting um, uh, the degree of and tangent of slopes and things like that the dimensions of stairs the level of lighting we get, we're going to talk in a second about me measuring <clears throat> quantifying how clean surfaces are um, we can think about footwear we're going to talk about that <clears throat> we can think about measuring activity uh, from a human factors perspective so there's all sorts of science we can put into this subject uh, and all sorts of ways we can measure it, uh, monitor it, and therefore improve it. So I'm going to pick on three areas to uh, do a bit more of a deep dive into. And the first one is footwear. So there's a difference between we supply safety footwear as, an, as a uh, statement. So, you know, do you have a problem? <coughs> Excuse me. Do you have a problem with slips and falls in your manufacturing business, for example? No, we supply safety footwear. There's a difference between that and taking the slipology approach, because not all footwear is created equal. There are all sorts of variables uh, that will drive how effective footwear is, and there's some great research being done uh, around the world on the efficacy of different materials, different tread patterns, etc., under different types of conditions and contaminants and different floor surfaces. Um, but just to say we supply safety footwear is a platitude, going back to what uh, James was talking about. Safety footwear does not mean slip resistant footwear necessarily. So safety footwear is typically, um, you know, ankle protection, steel toe cap, it might be. Uh, it's going to have some kind of textured sole like the one that I'm showing on the screen here. Um, but just because that sole is textured doesn't mean it's slip resistant. Or it might be slip resistant in certain circumstances, but not in others. Is it slip resistant enough for the circumstances that your staff are working in? So how can we take a scientific approach to this? Well, one example, uh, and I'm going to show a quick video here for those of you uh, that are um, able to see it. Um, as uh, HSL, which is part of uh, HSE, uh, has developed this test, uh, which is called the GRIP scheme. So this is a test to, to measure how slip resistant footwear is. You can see here, um, he's putting a foot in the right place. He's going to spray a bit of water on the floor and the foot is going to be slammed down onto the floor. And there's all sorts of testing and measurement going on, uh, which is assessing how slip resistant that piece of footwear is. So that's just one example on footwear. Rather than saying, you know, the superficial thing, which is we are uh, we're giving away, giving our staff safety footwear, uh, let's actually look at the scientific approach. Let's quantify how effective that safety footwear is. Uh, let's think about where we're using it and when and trying to get the most effective 
footwear for the use that we need. Second um, area I'm going to concentrate on today is, um, you know, might you have a slip and fall problem in your business? No, no, our floors are very, very clean. Or a variation of that. No, our cleaning company deals with that. Um, often common things that, that I would hear as a, as a sort of defensive uh, objection. Now, I, we're not here to talk about COVID. Uh, but if there's um, something we've learnt from COVID over the last few years, it's that a surface can be contaminated, but not look it. A surface doesn't have to look dirty to be contaminated. Those pesky uh, spores, if that's the right word, of COVID can be on a surface. We can't see them. They're invisible to the naked eye, but they can be there. Um, you can clean a surface ineffectively and still leave those uh, COVID spores behind, or you can clean it effectively uh, and you can remove them from the surface. And the, 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 the coronavirus uh, is here an analogy for any contaminant that might cause a surface to become slippery. So again, going back to what I said around uh, the sea in chimes contamination, if a surface is properly clean and it's dry, then it's very unlikely to be slippery. But you can find surfaces that look clean, in inverted commas, that are being regularly cleaned. Um, people are trying their best. They're doing a good job at cleaning. On the face of it, it looks fine. But actually, when you, uh, when you assess scientifically what's going on, the surface isn't clean. There is contamination. The maintenance is not being done uh, as well as possible. So just thinking and, and accepting that our floors look clean versus taking the slipology approach of trying to do this effectively, scientifically, properly, measurably to reduce risk. So what might that look like? Um, there's a product here, again, I've got a little video, uh, which is called Fresh Check. And this basically is a spray bottle, uh, which measures something called ATP. Um, I'm not going to butcher what that stands for, but it, it's basically organic matter on surfaces. And as you can see, when the um, surface is being sprayed, if it changes color, that shows that there's contamination on the surface. Um, another way of doing this is swabbing. So there's ATP swabs, which you can use, uh, but you have to have machinery for that, whereas Fresh Check is, is very uh, quick and easy. It's just a spray. So uh, this is a, a, a chopping board that's being sprayed, and you can see uh, where the surface is clean. It's coming out purple, and where it's contaminated, it's coming out in a, in a different colour. And you could do this at home, you could do this at work, uh, but put some kind of contamination uh, onto the surface. Uh, so here, for example, uh, this gentleman is putting a bit of milk on the surface. Uh, he's then going to wipe that milk off. Uh, oh no, actually, he's not going to wipe it off in this case. He's going to spray. Um, and you can see exactly where the milk was uh, on the surface. Uh, here is uh, a bit of uh, beef, perhaps, put on the surface. It's going to be removed. You can't see uh, that there's anything left on the surface. That surface looks clean. If you, if you said, is that clean? You'd say yes. Spray on the surface and you can see exactly where the organic matter is. So this method is a way of scientifically assessing if your cleaning is fully effective or not. You can clean a surface, then you can spray it with Fresh Check, and it will show you with the color change technology whether or not the surface is clean. So again, we're getting away from the superficial approach of it looks okay, um, looks can be deceiving uh, into a scientific approach. You know, is it clean? Is it scientifically clean? Can we prove it's clean? And if we know we've got a good floor surface and we know that our cleaning is effective, then the likelihood of someone slipping is going to be much, much lower. Third area uh, that I'll do a deep dive in uh, today into today is uh, surface. So, um, you know, uh, again, uh, question to somebody, might you have a slip and fall problem in, in your building? No, 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 we've got anti-slip floors. Okay. Um, what does that really mean? Uh, so the superficial way of thinking, the assumption that everybody makes, or most people make, uh, is that um, an anti-slip floor is a safe floor. 
So I've got an image here on the screen of a textured anti-slip floor or what would be perceived as an anti-slip floor in a leisure facility. Um, you can see it's uh, textured um, by the photograph and we were asked to slip test this floor and the results were, were very interesting. Now, if I move away that uh, bit of text over the photograph, you can see that that patch of floor there is significantly cleaner than the rest of the floor. And actually, interestingly, uh, once it's clean, you can't actually see the ridges uh, within the floor. It looks like it's almost smooth until you get up close to it. Um, but that floor, when we tested it before cleaning, uh, was very slippery when wet. When it was cleaned effectively, talking about uh, what we were just uh, mentioning, um, actually the floor when it's wet is very, very safe. It exceeds the HSE benchmark for safety. So they do have an anti-slip floor, they're right, um, but it wasn't performing like an anti-slip floor. Um, the risk of someone slipping on that floor was very, very high, much, much higher than their perception of that risk was. And so, again, you've got to get away from uh, these assumptions, um, these platitudes, these misperceptions into let's get into the science, let's get into the reality, let's get measuring. And um, you can measure how safe uh, or slip resistant uh, a floor surface is using uh, a machine called a pendulum test. Again, I've got a little video here for those able to see it uh, showing the pendulum test in action. What this does uh, is it's approved by and used by the HSE and it's used by the courts as well. It's the only test, it's the gold standard test that's used in the UK. Um, this mimics the heel striking the floor uh, and by standardising the heel, because there's a particular rubber that's used, uh, we're just measuring the friction provided by the floor. Um, so I'll just show you the video. Uh, so it's going to spray the floor, release the foot, it's going to swing down, strike the floor and swing through and it pushes a pointer onto a gauge and that uh, that number on the gauge is the result of the test. Just show it to you a second time, spray the floor, release the foot, swing down, strike the floor, swing through and push a, a pointer onto a gauge. So there's a scientific way of measuring how safe your surface is. The output of the test and you may have heard me speak about this before, is a pendulum test value. There are three categories of risk. So a score, a pendulum test value score of anything up to 24 gives you a high slip potential. A score of 25 to 35 gives you a moderate slip potential. And a score of 36 or above gives you a low slip potential. Um, but HSE did some research and they've gone even further and deeper into this. And you can see uh, here, if you're looking at the screen, the middle section, there's an accident risk exposure correlation to the PTV. So if you have a PTV of 24, then there's a one in 20 risk factor. Whereas if you have a PTV of 36, there's a one in a million risk factor. So let me know in the comments, would you rather in your business have a one in 20 slip risk or a one in a million slip risk? interested to know your thoughts on this what would you rather have one in 20 or one in a million and why why would you uh, prefer to have one or the other uh, interested to pick up on any comments you've got here so let's uh, let's summarize then because we've done a, a, a we've talked about slipology we've talked about chimes we've talked about these six areas uh, six reasons why people might slip we've done a bit of a deep dive showing you on three of them how there's a lot of science that you can put into this and this science will have a measurable, uh, a quantifiable, uh, a proven difference in the outcomes you get in terms of accidents, injuries and claims. So when we talk about slipology, uh, we can very confidently talk about a 50,000 X reduction in risk, because when we're finding flaws such as that one that I showed you uh, in the leisure center, where the wet slip resistance was giving a one in 20 uh, accident risk. And after it was effectively cleaned, it was uh, much less than a one in a million accident risk. That's a 50,000 times reduction in risk. So taking a scientific approach, 
we can put a number, we can have a confident number on our risk reduction. We can also be pretty confident um, based on uh, my experience over the last 10 plus years uh, that we can significantly reduce the number of accidents, injuries and claims. So here's four examples, um, a swimming pool chain where we uh, manage to help them to reduce their claims by 85%. I talked about that actually a few weeks ago. Uh, it was the difference between one claim a week and one claim a month. A busy train station in London uh, where taking this scientific approach using slipology, we were able to uh, help the train operating company uh, or network rail actually in this case to uh, reduce their slip and fall accidents by 60%. So even in a busy train station, uh, even with millions of people a year, 60% fewer accidents. Um, shopping centre, uh, which is operated by CBRE, one of our clients, a shiny terrazzo floor with a slope right inside the door. Uh, here we were able to uh, drive down accidents to zero, in fact, for, for 18 months. So a very, very uh, significant improvement. Uh, and even in hotel bathrooms, so think of the uh, surface that is most slippery, that's designed to be slippery, that's designed to be wet. You can think of its bathtubs. Um, this particular three-star uh, hotel uh, in a particular location was having a large number of accidents. And again, um, taking the scientific approach, thinking about what we can do to engineer uh, out the risk, uh, the uh, output of that was 85% fewer accidents. So there is a science to this. Um, it's proven, uh, it's measurable, it really does work. And this is the approach that um, we need to be taking if we want to get away from that slip uh, safety plateau where year after year we're sort of a third uh, or, or a bit less of, uh, of accidents, injuries and claims across the UK. So uh, to help with that I've got a special offer for you. So anybody that's uh, watching, listening to uh, engaging with this, uh, even on the replay, uh, reach out to me, you can send me a DM on LinkedIn, uh, you can send me an email, charris at slipsafety.co.uk, or you can give us a call in the office 0203 355 and uh, we'll come and give you a 50% off slip test. So we'll come in and uh, do that testing for you on up to six areas of your, six floor areas in your building, uh, and we'll do that for 50% off. Um, so that's a, a special offer to get you started on the journey of looking at slips more scientifically. Um, actually, when we're there, we can do some fresh check uh, testing as well to show you how uh, clean or not your floors are. So uh, you can have two for the price of one almost and half price. So how, how about that for you for a special offer? So that's it from me in terms of the content. Um, I've got a couple of questions that have come through, but I'm happy to... Uh, to take more questions uh, for those of you on the Zoom. You can drop stuff in the chat or you can uh, go to reactions and raise your hand. Um, so what did you think about slipology? What did you learn? Uh, what science are you using now to mitigate the risk of slips and falls in your buildings? Interested to know or, or even in, if not in the area of slips and falls, what science are you using uh, in other areas of safety? And what can we learn from that? Um, what do you think of those things that I shared with you today you could implement first? And is there anything that I can do uh, to help? Um, just quickly, um, the next safety roundtable is going to be in two weeks' time. Uh, so we're going to have a break next week because it's uh, A, it's half term, B, it's Jubilee week. So it's a very, very busy and short week. So I figured that uh, probably not the best time to be chatting about uh, about safety necessarily. So the next session will be... Uh, on Wednesday the 8th of June, 9 o'clock, and we're going to be talking about selling safety, how to make them care. Um, so this will be an interesting episode, and there's going to be a podcast actually uh, coming out uh, around that time uh, talking about selling in safety as well with a guy called Simon Jones, the safety salesman. So uh, let's open it up then to questions. I'm going to stop sharing, uh, and um, feel free to raise your hand if you're on the Zoom uh, to answer a question, uh, sorry, to ask a question. Uh, in the meantime, uh, I've got a question here, which somebody sent me uh, on uh, on DM. 
Um, so how often would we be looking at doing these kinds of tests? Uh, so that's a good, that's a very good question. So um, footwear testing, I think that um, you know you need to do that when you're choosing your footwear uh, to make sure that you're choosing the right ones. Uh, there are tests to do in terms of wear and tear just to make sure that footwear continues to be effective. Uh, but I wouldn't see that as being a necessarily a, a very, very regular test. I think once you've established what works uh, and how long that's going to last for you, then, um, then that should be good enough. Uh, if you think about the fresh check, uh, I would say that should be it's something that you could do pretty regularly and consistently because it's dead simple to do, as you, as you saw in the video. Uh, literally, you're just spraying it onto the floor. Uh, and seeing what the results are. So certainly if you're changing your cleaning contractor or if you're changing your cleaning methods, you should do that testing to ensure that the new method of cleaning is effective. But I'd also suggest doing that periodically uh, just to check because, you know, we all know what it's like in the real world. Um, are things, our processes done perfectly every single day? Not necessarily. So it's good just to audit and check what's going on. <clears throat> In terms of the uh, pendulum slip testing, um, I would say, based on my experience of uh, insurance claims and uh, court cases, if you've got testing, which is a testing certificate, which says that the floor was safe um, in its intended use, so typically that's going to be a PTV of 36 plus when wet, um, and that test is more than a year old, as in it was done more than a year before the accident or incident that led to the claim, uh, you're in a less strong position than if that test had been done within a year. Because things can change. So think again about that photograph I showed you of the floor. That was a safe floor, but it obviously had degraded because the maintenance had been ineffective. And, and when we tested it, it wasn't a safe floor. Um, now, these things can change much more quickly than within a year, um, but it's all about what's reasonable and practicable. So I would say doing it annually as a minimum uh, in these kind of higher risk areas that are more likely to get wet or contaminated would be sound advice and would stand you in good stead. Um, it might be, and some clients do uh, ask us to do that testing more frequently, um, but we always kind of advise that annually is, is pretty uh, pretty much a good way of uh, of going okay so thank you for that question um here's another question in the chat <clears throat> uh would you say that determining your ideal risk factor on the pendulum test would depend on the level of footfall through that specific area good question um so as with anything in health and safety in the uk uh it, it's all about a risk assessment based approach. So uh, what I would say, though, is uh, when it comes to slips, I think footfall is a factor, but less of a factor compared to the likelihood of the floor becoming wet or contaminated. So, for example, uh, if you had a kitchen floor where you only had two chefs in that kitchen at any one time and you decided to uh, replace the uh, floor with a shiny marble uh, and that was very slippery when wet um, that would not be very sensible clearly and I'm just using an extreme example here but um, even though there's only two people using that floor that floor is constantly going to be wet or contaminated and therefore uh, you'd be expected to have a floor that was safe uh, in that area uh, whereas you could have um, thinking of a, a a train station, for example, where you might have millions of people going through a train station in, in the middle of London uh, every year, or certainly before COVID anyway. Um, once you're beyond the uh, entrance area where ingress of water is most likely and the floor is most likely to get contaminated, um, the middle of the concourse, it's actually, even though the footfall is very high, it's unlikely that that floor is going to get wet um, other than through a spillage. So as long as you've got a good uh, grasp of how you deal with spillages and a good process for dealing with spillages then in that case I would say that it's that that's going to drive 
the PTV that you should be looking for more so than the footfall. Um, footfall is, an, is, a, is certainly a factor to consider. It's particularly a factor to consider when you think about uh, changes uh, and wear and tear and things like that uh, as well. So if you've got a, a floor that is being used by you know, millions of people versus two people, then things like maintenance and uh, cleaning and wear and tear uh, are likely to be more affected by the higher footfall. So I think footfall would drive perhaps frequency of uh, testing, uh, perhaps more so than the uh, specification or the output of the floor uh, that you would, would be looking to achieve. Thanks for that question, Kieran. That's a good, good question. I enjoyed that one. Uh, another question in the chat. Um, can you use FreshCheck on surfaces in contact with food? Is it food grade? Yes, it's absolutely designed um, as uh, to be used in food facilities. So actually, that's that's their business is is for uh, food safety use. Um, what I've seen is that actually you can learning the lessons from what works in food safety. You can incorporate some of that into what we do in the world of, of slips uh, and in the world of, of just hygiene which obviously is an important uh, important safety factor nowadays. Um, and uh, and you can f figure out something that works somewhere and implement it and have real value in using it for some, some other use. So yes, absolutely it is. Um, if you want to send me a, a DM um, or, uh, or ask the question on LinkedIn or something, then I can uh, introduce you to the guys at FreshCheck uh, who'd be happy to chat to you about that. Uh, another question in the chat, um, how much of an impact would improper dosing practices and cleaning operations and continual buildup of chemical on a floor have on the surface? Uh, and also would non-chemical cleaning methods be preferable? Good question there from, from Darren, who I know is in the cleaning uh, industry. So yes, absolutely. Um, if you are overdosing uh, your chemical, in other words, you're using too much chemical, what you're likely to get is uh, a buildup of residue on the surface because chemicals, cleaning chemicals typically contain surfactants uh, and these will kind of almost leave like a, um, a sticky uh, residue on the surface. So you, you probably come across floors uh, that, that felt sticky to walk upon and that's normally where they're being mopped every day uh, with too much chemical on them. So overdosing uh, absolutely can be a problem. Equally, underdosing could, could be a problem uh, because uh, if you're not using enough chemical for the chemical to be effective at removing the contamination, then the contamination is still present on the floor. So it's important to get this right. And again, I would say it's important to verify the efficacy uh, of the cleaning method, whichever method you're going to use uh, by doing uh, the slip testing using the fresh check or something similar and just checking that it's really working uh, well. Um, second follow-up question, would non-chemical cleaning methods be preferable? Um, they absolutely can be in uh, in many cases. Uh, what, what again I would say is that we need to verify and use the science just to, just to check that that is working effectively. Um, but certainly I've seen good examples in, you know, busy uh, high footfall retail spaces where actually you don't necessarily need a chemical to be cleaning the floor. It depends on the floor, of course. Um, whereas if you're thinking about a, a fast food restaurant, uh, then I would suggest that you would need some kind of chemical because of the grease that's building up in the air and, and, and being laid onto the floor. Uh, you're probably going to need some kind of chemical to uh, to sort of break down that uh, that grease and actually remove it from the floor um, effectively. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. Um, right, we're coming up to time. So I'm going to take one more question, the last question in the chat, unless anybody wants to, to join in, unmute and, and be brave and join in. Um, as part of your services on checking flooring, do you analyze the cleaning regime and then put in recommendations? Um, yes, we, we definitely do that. Um, so when we're going in to uh, help somebody, um, what we do, uh, and I'll share the screen again, is uh, we look at chimes. So we would go in um, and we would analyze 
uh, all of these areas. So if we're doing a pendulum slip test, uh, we're learning about 50% of this problem. So we're learning about the surface, um, we're learning about maintenance because we're looking at cleaning, we're learning about contamination. Uh, but we would also comment on all these other things. Um, so we would comment on footwear, we would comment on um, uh, individual human factors, we'd comment on environment, we'd look at things like matting, uh, canopies, slopes, steps and stairs and things like that. Um, what we don't do is uh, we don't make or sell any chemicals, we don't make or sell any cleaning equipment or anything like that, so we're totally independent, totally agnostic when it comes to that, but we absolutely can help with um, methodologies and advice uh, and you know what we typically do if we find there's a cleaning issue uh, is we get you the client to tell us you know um, who your suppliers are what you're currently using and then we see if we can figure out a way using the manpower uh, equipment and suppliers that you've got to do things a bit better by tweaking the um, methodology we also sometimes get involved in uh, in doing like a deep clean as a service that's one of the services we offer um, is, a, is a deep clean so uh, sometimes we come in and and the floors in a pretty poor condition uh, we might say okay look here's your here's your problem um, one option would be for us to come and deep clean it for you and then get it back to to brand new and to being safe again uh, then we test it and certify it obviously and then we could work with you on that same basis to um, uh, to look at what can be done to maintain it Great. Well, look, thank you very much, guys, for joining today. I'm just going to uh, scroll through these slides and remind you that uh, the next safety roundtable is in two weeks time. We're going to be talking about selling safety, how to make them care. Uh, Wednesday, the 8th of June, uh, I'll stick up a LinkedIn event uh, probably in the next couple of days for that. Uh, but if you register on the Zoom via safetyroundtable.co.uk, you will be invited to all sessions. Thanks very much for your um, participation and the great questions today. Very much enjoyed it and uh, look forward to seeing you all uh, in a couple of weeks time. And do remember to take advantage, uh, reach out to me, take advantage of that uh, special offer, 50% off of a slip test. Uh, DM me on LinkedIn, drop me an email, charris at slipsafety.co.uk or give us a ring in the office 0203 three double five five oh one eight thanks a lot and see you again on the next safety roundtable thanks for joining us on the safety and risk success podcast if you've enjoyed this episode please hit follow and do share on social media does anyone you know spring to mind as a great guest even yourself if so, please contact us on podcast at slipsafety.co.uk. See you next week for another episode.